It is my pleasure to bring Alexandra Aldrich to the kitchen table, if you will, mm -hmm. to talk about your life. And you are a descendant of Mrs. Astor, if you will. Where do you fall in succession, just to give folks who are listening to this, where do you fall in succession to Mrs. Astor? Well, actually, I'm a direct descendant of John Jacob Astor. He is my great, 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 great grandfather. Um, his son, William B. Astor, um, lived in the house where I grew up. That was his primary residence. It's a 43-room mansion called, on a property called Rokeby that's been in my family for over 300 years. In the Hudson years. Valley. Yes. Um, the Mrs. Astor, who was Caroline Skirmahorn, who married one of William B. Astor's sons, um, is, not my, is not my ancestor. She's from, she is from a separate branch of, the same, of one of the children of William B. Astor. I descend from the daughter of William B. Astor, Emily, who married a Sam Ward, and that branch uh, has remained at Rokeby um, till today. At one time, there was a ton of money, and there were houses built all over the place, including in Newport and in New York. Mm -hmm. You just wrote a book called The Astor Orphan. I must tell you, I, I couldn't put it down to talk about your lifestyle in this 43-room mansion on 450 acres, an only child, a very bohemian lifestyle behind the walls of this what seemed to be bucolic, gorgeous mm -hmm. mansion. You decided at some point to tell the world in this book what your childhood was like. And, and sum it up in a little bit. We're, we're going to look at a video in a second, mm -hmm. but how would you sum up your childhood inside this mansion? Well, I, I grew up in what was essentially a house museum, although officially it was not. Um, my uncle was the town historian when I was a child, so he put Rokeby on the National Registry for Historic Sites, uh, which meant that we were visited by historical societies on a regular basis. Um, whenever I saw a coach bus driving up our front driveway, um, I would feel dread that strangers were once again coming to view us. Um, I was often part of the tour, as if I were part of an exhibit. Uh, I'd be introduced as one of the um, next generation of Astor descendants to live at Rokeby. I sometimes would be asked to play the violin um, just to prove that despite the loss of wealth, we held on to our refinement. Uh, and then I'd be asked to, um, to leave. That would be the end of my uh, performance, if you will. On the other hand, we really lived, uh, my parents and I lived on the third floor. In the servants' quarters. In the servants' quarters. The third floor was where all the broken things were put. Um, but unlike regular storage that is organized and held behind closed doors, uh, anything that, that family didn't want was just discarded pell-mell um, in front of our apartment door. Um, torn horsehair mattresses, cracked trunks, um, old Victorian rocking horses. So it was very messy. Um, and to make matters worse, we were not allowed to actually use the antiques that were in the formal front rooms of the house. Because they were... For show they and were on for display. show, and the family also seemed to um, live in uh, under the delusion that that nothing had changed since the, since my great grandmother died in 1963. That somehow there were servants to, to clean the house, even though there weren't. Um, somehow things would take care of themselves, and I think that by not seeing. The reality, they were able to avoid the responsibility of taking care of, fixing up the house, uh, cleaning it. So you basically grew up hungry. That's right. In squalor. That's right. Neither of my parents had a job, um, and there was no inherited money, just the property. Um, my mother was from Poland and didn't even know English for the first few years that she lived at Rokeby. My father... Um, as did his ancestors, uh, retired to Rokeby at the age of 30 after getting the requisite Ivy League education um, and traveling widely. What happened? He was, he was the son of an alcoholic. That's right. And two alcoholics. Two alcoholics and couldn't get out. I mean, he, he was Ivy League educated. Well, he could have gotten out, but he had been raised uh, largely by his grandmother, who was one of the Astor orphans, the great-grandchildren of William Astor. And she... Um, had a, a, a portion, a large portion of the Astor fortune, but she lived on it, and she lived to be almost 100. So he was used to um, 
being around people who had money somewhere. So he has always had a very casual attitude towards money to begin with. He doesn't mind not having it. He doesn't care if he has it. He doesn't, he doesn't manage it well. Um, but the idea was that he was to become a gentleman farmer. That was what his ancestors had done. So he took on the role of uh, the caretaker of the property. But without help, he ended up being the only maintenance man on the property. We're going to take a look at this video right now, and then we're going to talk more about your childhood. So let, let's take a look at your life. Okay. It seemed to outsiders always to be an ideal place. People would come and visit and say, wow, I wish I'd grown up in a place like this. And I always wanted them to take me home with them to their neat little uh, houses, wherever, you know, whatever I imagined them to live in. The, the history was, um, was overwhelming, and the, the family's main mission seemed to me to have been to preserve the history, because if they lost it in some way, it would impinge on their identities as descendants of the Astors. I was part of the poorer branch of the family, um, and we indeed were very poor when I was a child. So I was stuck between being this child of an aristocratic family on the one hand with very high standards, highly cultured, everybody around me was highly educated, and on the other hand we hardly had food in the house, or we had no heat, you know, I wore thrift shop clothing, so I was very confused about who I was. I had, you know, memories, clear memories of specific moments in, in my childhood, but I could not see a big picture. You know, I could not put it together. And when I wrote the story, I was forced to find the narrative there, and find what my childhood was about, what my life was about growing up here. Um, it took a really long time to figure that out. You decide to write this book, why? Well, in 2005, I was going through a divorce, and um, for personal reasons, I needed to return to Rokeby indefinitely. I was a single mother, and I had avoided returning to Rokeby. This was something I did not want to do. Because, because I, you felt trapped there as a kid. That's right, and I was afraid that it would absorb me the way it had absorbed um, the adults in my life growing up. It, it, it does. It's all consuming. The house is so needy. It just, you look around and you just want to start painting. And that's exactly what happened. Despite my best intentions, I was drawn back into that. And I started to um, paint the balustrades and the, um, the, the, the steps in the house. I, I scraped and painted and started cleaning. And, and I just, it took, for a whole year, that's all I did. And it was actually very therapeutic because I was trying to forget the court battle that I was going through. Um, so it, it was productive as well. I, I felt satisfied by the work. Um, but as I was cleaning, I was revisiting the places I'd grown up in, um, all the corners of my childhood. And that brought back so many memories. Uh, I felt overwhelmed. Some terrible. Terrible, but not traumatic. Just it was actually very health, healthy for me to relive those memories and to feel the feelings that I actually didn't allow myself to feel as a child. I was always told by um, the adults in my life that it's embarrassing to express feelings, which is a very waspy um, mentality. So I wasn't uh, encouraged to talk about what was going on and how I felt about really not having much money but, and, and about all the confusion of growing up in this very grand house but barely having anything to eat. Um, so in any case, it was all cathartic for me because once I started, well, I had so many memories, I needed to put them down on paper. I had to unload. And I felt um, there, was, there was no choice in the matter. It wasn't a decision. It had to be done. So I started writing. And um, I believed that I released a lot of the story. And I, and, I, and I don't feel as held by the past as I used to feel. Um, for most of my adult life, I actually kept my family history a secret. I didn't want people to view me as an Astor descendant. I wanted them to see me for who I am. Um, so it, it ended up that the healthiest thing was not to hold on to the secret, because when you hold on to something, it, it consumes you. I think you write this book loosely based around the age of seven or eight, and the things that are going on. And then you get a, a little older toward the end. Yeah. But just a slice of what was going on there. There, there was there was one part of this book that disturbed me as a mother, and it has to do with a dollhouse. And and what happened? Um, well, 
I had uh, used the Victorian dollhouse, um, which is about a five foot tall a dollhouse. Grand, a grand dollhouse. dollhouse with four rooms, an open front, and, um, and wallpaper inside. And I always assumed it was mine because I'd always had it in my room. And then one day, um, my aunt was visiting, and she had children. She has two daughters, and they were a few years younger than I was. So it just disappeared. And I started looking desperately through the house and found it in their room. And this was a wealthier part of the family that. Yes, that's right. And when I protested, I was told that the house was not mine, that it belongs, the dollhouse belongs to the house. And I didn't understand what that meant. But this scene exemplifies what it was like and still is like to share the house. Joint ownership is very difficult. Um, it's always a bit unclear as to which spaces in the house belong to whom. And we all have, all the family members have a room in the house. But if someone leaves for too long, they might find when they come back that their room has been taken over by someone else, that their stuff has been moved. Um, the boundaries remain very unclear. I asked you, I said, can you step away from this? But it's not that easy because nobody can afford to buy you out. And you said there's nine owners. That's right. As a kid, you said you wish you'd just grown up in a, in a ranch house or a three-bedroom house and just like any other kids. That's right. I, I was always fascinated by middle class order. Um, I went to a school with kids who were middle class. Um, and Did you ever bring them home for play dates? No, I tried to avoid that. Um, everyone knew that we were the local aristocrats, that we were descended from Livingston's and Astor's. Um, and I didn't want to shatter the illusion that we lived in this grand mansion. Of course, we did live in a mansion, but I didn't want them to see the reality. You were embarrassed? Yes. Um, I was embarrassed, and um, I think I was the only person who was embarrassed. I, I always felt, I always wondered why the adults in my life were not embarrassed by the mess and the disrepair. But um, they really lived in, in another reality. They didn't see it. And they still do to some, yes, to some degree? Yes, I think they still do. Now, your folks are still there? That's right. My parents still live there. My father is 73 years old, and he still climbs up on the ladder and fixes the roof. Um, he does pretty much all the work. And, and, and things, and it is to some extent a museum, and things just get shuffled around. You played dress up in evening gowns. Your grandmother wore to high society events. Right. And you cranked a gramophone that was a personal gift from Thomas Edison. That's right. It, this is unbelievable to most of the viewing public. Of course. I didn't appreciate at the time, and I do appreciate more now, that it is an incredible gift to know, to know your, who your ancestors were, to be surrounded by artifacts from their lives. Um, so many people don't even know who their great-grandparents were. So on the, that is amazing. It's just that I, I got a clear message as a child that that was more important than my welfare. Keeping the house was more important, um, that these objects were a source of pride, whereas I was not necessarily as interesting. How did you get through this? Now, you're, you're a seventh grade teacher now in Brooklyn. This lifestyle that you lived, which of course all you knew, but you seemed, when I read this book, the adult <laughs> in the whole thing going on. Is that pretty, am I hitting that? Well, my grandmother was, she was an alcoholic, but she was also a caretaker. And she, she lived she, in, an out, in a, a house? She lived in um, the old chauffeur's garage that had been converted into a house. It was actually very nice. It was actually much more um, normal <laughs> than the big house, the mansion. Um, but I think because I hadn't been... I hadn't learned the denial that, seemed, that the adults in my life seemed to live in. I hadn't learned it yet. So I was just coming into awareness around the age of 9 and 10. Um, so to me, I, I saw it through with clear eyes. So I was very embarrassed for everyone around me who didn't seem to be embarrassed. What did the violin do for you? So the violin um, created order out of chaos. The violin, um, I, I loved music. Um, and I had a practice record, and I kept very close, um, I, I kept um, a close record of how many minutes I practiced every day. I really wanted 
a Chinese mother. I longed for a Chinese mother because <laughs> all the amazing violin students I saw were Chinese. And, I, and their parents would come to the lessons and take notes. And the next week, they would, they would have improved dramatically. And that's what I wanted, um, that kind of discipline. I did instill discipline on myself as much as I could. Um, that's what I'm talking about. You're seven or eight years old, nine years old, and you're instilling it. I've got to do this, I've got to do this, I've got to take care of myself. Um, sometimes you would shop with your dad and money would come from somebody <laughs> that you would just drive up and cash would come well, out. Well, we were the local aristocrats to some people and we were the local charity case to others. So um, we relied on food donations very often. My father uh, loved getting things for free. To him it was an adventure to figure out how to get things for free. So the local pie factory donated the dented TV dinners to us. The seconds, if you will. Yes, which I loved because TV dinners were amazing to me. They were, they're so organized. <laughs> <laughs> but you, um, you had relatives upstairs or downstairs in a different apartment that were, it was an, was an aunt. My uncle and aunt lived that, in and, the back. And they lived in the back and everything was in order there. But well, they didn't treat you so great. Yeah, because my uncle had a real job quote unquote, real job in the outside world, um, you know, his family had some money, not terribly much, but enough that they were comfortable. Living under the same roof. Yes, under the same on. roof. So I um, tagged along with them, if you will, um, on family vacations. Um, I ate as much, I ate meals in their kitchen, um, but I, I was a little bit embarrassed. I felt um, like a foster child. But I, I would think at some point, that DCF or Department of Children and Families should come in because you you <laughs> did not have food and yet you know 16 bedrooms down they had food and it was orderly this is so bizarre I have to tell you well I think nobody no one considered that there was deprivation because of who we were people the community was proud of us nobody wanted to think that we were um, and you didn't needy tell. and I kept it I kept it quiet is there a second book or, I mean, writing a book is daunting. Mm, yes. And all the memories came back, and you say that it was cathartic. Is there another book to come? Are you done? Where, where do you go? I mean, do you just live your merry life and go <laughs> back to, to the mansion from time to time and take your son and fish and, and have him see it as a country estate, if you will, I guess? Where, where do you go from here? Um, I would love to write full time, um, but it is certainly difficult to uh, write a book. It has taken, it, it took me four years from the time I started writing to the time that it actually got published. So it is, um, it really requires so much attention and I'm not sure, I hope, I hope to write another book. Well, thank you so much for sharing just a piece <laughs> of your life with us. It's fascinating, sad, mm -hmm. but you grew up to be Awesome. <laughs> and thank you for coming on. I so appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome.